In the 15th century, a growing number of European merchants and explorers tried finding different trade routes as business in the Middle East became increasingly difficult due to tension with the Ottoman Empire and Mamluks. This was especially true for Portugal, as the Eastern Mediterranean was itself already controlled by other merchant powers like Venice. So they set about finding ways into Asia, or more specifically the Far East, that bypassed the Middle East. Asia was a lucrative market, since spices grown there could be sold at high price back in Europe. And it was in this search for access to Asia that passage around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean was eventually discovered. This opened new opportunities for those willing to undertake the voyage, but it was not without any risk. The journey to Asia was long and hard, taking several months. It was not uncommon for ships to get damaged or even sink. The crew would also need fresh water and supplies. This could of course be stored on board, but that was risky since it could easily be lost due to spoilage, storm, rats, or even the ship itself being damaged. And so outposts were created along the new trade route that was soon no longer only used by Portuguese merchants, but also Spanish, British, and Dutch. In 1652, a small outpost was established in southern Africa, centered on the Cape of Good Hope. Later known as Cape Colony, Jan van Rievek of the Dutch United East India Company intended for the colony to serve as a layover port for vessels trading in Asia. The colony started out small but grew quickly, attracting settlers from the Netherlands, Germany, and Scandinavia. What's more, in 1685, Huguenot settlers fleeing religious persecution in France began to arrive in the colony. As the only permanent settlement of the VOC not serving exclusively as a trading post, it proved an ideal retirement place for employees of the company. Indeed, after several years of service in the company, an employee could lease a piece of land in the colony as a free citizen, on which they cultivated crops that were later sold to VOC ships needing to resupply for a fixed price. As the colony grew, new problems arose, however. The previously mentioned farms were labor-intensive, and therefore free citizens imported slaves from Madagascar, Mozambique, and Asia, particularly the Dutch East Indies and Ceylon, which rapidly increased the number of the colony's inhabitants. The descendants of these multi-ethnic people are nowadays called coloreds in modern South Africa, while the white European settlers that expanded the original colony's borders came to be called Boers. The word Boer or Boerfolk means farmer or farmer people and refers to the way of life most Boers adopted. And yes, I know I'm pronouncing it with an American accent. Anyway, many Boers moved inland to escape the VOC, which among other things told farmers what to grow and for what price, tightly controlled internal movement, and monopolized all trade. In response, the company declared the Hamtus River as the eastern frontier of the colony, only to see the so-called trek boars, a name given to those who adopted a nomadic pastoralist lifestyle, cross it soon afterwards. More on this in a moment. There also was, of course, the indigenous African population, one of the most important being the San people. Sometimes also called Bushmen, the San are one of the oldest surviving hunter-gatherer cultures in the region and often were enslaved or pushed off their land by European settlers. In 1795, Cape Colony was occupied by the British following the Battle of Meisenberg. London wanted to avoid French control of the region, which likely would have threatened British trade with India, and was fearful over what Paris might do following Napoleon Bonaparte's occupation of the Netherlands. After the relationship between the British and French improved, however, the colony was placed under the nominal control of the Batavia Republic in 1803, a client state of France. This was then sealed with the Treaty of Amiens. But deja vu, relations soured again in 1806. The British again occupied the colony following the Battle of Blauberg. After this, Cape Colony would remain under British rule, which was formally approved by the Convention of London in 1814. Roughly a three-month voyage from London, Cape Colony had a European population of approximately 25,000, most of whom lived in the biggest city, Cape Town. In addition to this, the colony had about 30,000 slaves. British rule saw the introduction of basic rights for the Cape's African population, as the slave trade was abolished in 1807 and slavery itself was then later abolished in 1834. 
That being said, the government proved unable to rein in settler violence against the San, which continued largely unabated as it had during the Dutch period. But before that, in 1820, Britain encouraged several groups of colonists from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, the so-called 1820 settlers, to settle in the Eastern Cape. You see, after the Napoleonic Wars, Britain experienced an unemployment crisis and figured that by encouraging mostly poor and unemployed to settle in its new holding in southern Africa, it could strengthen the colony's eastern frontier and build up an English-speaking population. Most of these settlers arrived in Port Elizabeth, nowadays Gebecha. The Boers, who mostly spoke Afrikaans, a West Germanic language derived from the Dutch vernacular of Holland proper, were, however, not happy about the changes the British introduced, and over time a divide soon emerged in which the urban elites were mostly British, while those who lived outside urban centers in more rural parts of the colony were often Boers. The abolition of slavery also caused tension, as the Boers could technically get compensation for their losses, but only in Britain, which of course was not easily accessible in the 19th century. All the more for a farmer in a remote corner of the world. What's more, Boers, particularly those in more remote farmsteads, felt the British did little to protect them from attacks by natives. This resentment caused many Boers to move inland en masse in what became known as the Great Trek. The British were, however, still not able to bring peace to their colony. Many settlers continued violence against the San in the west, and new settlers in the east also created problems with various Bantu peoples. And while this was mostly outside the borders of Cape Colony, it still very often had impacts within its borders. All right. The Bantu peoples are an ethno-linguistic grouping of approximately 400 distinct native African groups who speak Bantu languages. In Cape Colony, the Bantu were mostly located in the east, whereas other native groups like the San were primarily found in the west. One specific group created a whole new conflict in the east with the previously mentioned Trek Boers. Having adopted a nomadic pastoralist lifestyle long before the British arrived, the Trek Boers soon found themselves in conflict with the Kosa, a Bantu ethnic group, after the Dutch declared the colony's borders to be the Great Fish River, even though many Kosa lived along its western bank. The Dutch then tried forcefully removing the Kosa, which sparked off the Kosa Wars, a series of nine conflicts between 1779 and 1879. Just before the ninth and final of these conflicts, something disastrous happened to the Kosa. In April 1856, a 16-year-old prophetess known as Nangawuse declared the Kosa ancestors would rise from the dead in huge numbers, drive all Europeans into the sea, and give the living gifts of horses, sheep, goats, dogs, fowls, and all manner of clothing and food in great amounts. They would also restore the elderly to youth and would usher in a utopian era of prosperity. However, she continued saying the dead would only enact this on the condition the Kosa first destroyed all their means of sustenance. They needed to kill all their cattle and burn all their crops. At first, no one believed Nongawuse's prophecy, but in time, her words gave rise to what would become known as the cattle killing movement, which quickly spread across the Eastern Cape. British authorities in Cape Colony feared the movement would result in mass chaos, famine, and economic collapse, so they desperately appealed to the Kosa to ignore her prophecy. But many Kosa, including King Sarhili, continued to kill their cattle and destroy their crops. Then, on February 18, 1857, the date Nongawuse had predicted the Kosa ancestors would rise from the dead, nothing happened. The cattle killings would nonetheless continue until 1858, as some believed not enough had been done to meet the requirements of the prophecy. However, famine quickly set in, as tens of thousands would die from starvation. And in the ninth and last of the Kosa Wars, the last independent Kosa state was conquered and then annexed in 1879. Honestly, this is just one of many stories from the Kosa Wars that we could make an entire video about, so if you would like to see us cover the conflict in more detail, let us know down below in the comments. Anyway, let's get back to the Great Trek for a moment, because while the Kosa Wars were still ongoing, more and more Boers, known as Vortrekkers, meaning pathfinders or pioneers, continued to move inland to escape British rule. In time, they established several autonomous Boer republics. 
We unfortunately can't talk about all of these here, but we'll eventually do an episode on each of the various Boer republics. For the sake of brevity though, we'll limit ourselves to just those which are essential for our story right now. Somewhat interestingly, as they made their way east, the Vortrekkers found mostly uninhabited lands, but were most likely unaware that just a couple years earlier, a catastrophe had occurred in the region. King Shaka, leader of the Zulu, had risen to power in 1816. He soon ordered reforms that reorganized the kingdom's military into a formidable regional force, and this begat a period known as the Mifikane, meaning crushing, scattering, forced dispersal, and or forced migration, which lasted from the 1810s to the 1840s. As the kingdom sought to expand its borders, those who could escaped. Those who couldn't often were killed, enslaved, or forcibly recruited into the Zulu military. Forced migration resulted in famine and the spread of disease, while those displaced sometimes got into conflict with other tribes in the lands they entered. It's still debated exactly how many people lost their lives in this tragedy, but most estimates put the number around 1 to 2 million. Shaka himself was later assassinated by two of his half-brothers in 1828, one of them, Dingane, then became king of the Zulu. At the time of Shaka's death, he reigned over an estimated 250,000 people and had roughly 50,000 soldiers under his command, an enormous number for the time. As a result of the Mifikane, the Vortrekkers entered a largely depopulated territory. Those who decided to settle in what nowadays is called KwaZulu-Natal wanted to establish permanent boundaries for their settlement, and therefore opted to conclude a treaty with King Degane that would grant the Trekkers the right to land in exchange for recovering cattle the Zulu had previously lost to a neighboring tribe. Dingane agreed to a deed of session and then invited the Vore Trekkers leader, Piet Retief, and roughly a hundred other men to celebrate the treaty. Instead, the Trekkers were taken to a nearby ridge where they were clubbed to death. Retief was the last to be killed so as to witness the death of his son and comrades. His body was then mutilated with some of his organs later being presented to Dingane. This was just the start. After the killing of Retief, Dingane ordered his warriors to kill the unsuspecting Vortrekkers camped along the Bushman River, near the modern city of Vena. Approximately 532 people, including 56 women and 185 children, were killed in what later came to be known as the Vene Massacre, Vene being a Dutch word for something akin to weeping. Vortrekker encampments in other parts of the region were soon targeted, as were those of African tribes accompanying the trekkers. All of this eventually culminated in a battle along the Nakome called the Battle of Blood River on December 16, 1838. 664 Vortrekkers, under the command of Andres Pretorius, were attacked by an estimated 10,000 to 15,000 Zulus. And so the Trekkers made use of a technique known as a lahar, or wagon fort. Basically, this is a temporary fortification of wagons arranged into a rectangle, circle, or other shape, which can serve as an improvised military camp. The Trekkers, of course, were not the only people to use such a technique, but were successfully able to keep the Zulus at bay and surprisingly claimed victory without any loss, whereas the Zulus lost about 3,000 men. As always with numbers, those documented here may not be 100% accurate, but one thing is for sure, this was a massive victory for the Vortrekkers, who then negotiated an alliance with the Zulu prince, Mapande, to overthrow Dingane. This proved successful, and Mapande allowed the Trekkers to settle in the region. A year later, in 1839, they established the Republic of Natalia, which lasted until 1843 when it was annexed by the British. Following this, it was transformed into the colony of Natal. This in turn saw many Boers yet again leave Natal for the Northwest. But we'll be covering that in another episode. And because of that, I'm not going to give a rating on the Ghost Countries Index just yet. So yeah. I do however want to give a big thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon, and if you'd like to help the channel too, there's a link down in the description.